I decided to uh, give you an overview about uh, one of part of my program that uh, deals with studying compact objects uh, and black holes in particular and extensions of general relativity so that we can probe the strong field regime of gravity with gravitational waves and black holes. And the particular uh, works that I'm presenting here are based on a series of recent papers with, uh, so one uh, uh, set of uh, results is with, uh, re obtained with Hector Carter da Silva, my PhD student Matthew Ali, and my colleague at Illinois, uh, Nico Yunus. And then the uh, second part of results uh, was done in collaboration with Banaf Shirai Lilu, who is a, a PhD student at the University of Amsterdam. Really excellent work uh, that she has done here. And her supervisors are Tanya Hindra and Samaya Nestanke. And we worked together also with Nestor Ortiz, who uh, recently became an assistant professor at the University of Mexico uh, in Mexico City. And as you can see from my title, I shamelessly quote uh, Sherlock Holmes here, because for me, you know, understanding nature um, and uh, understanding open questions of nature is really like solving a puzzle. And uh, to me, the scientific method introduced in Sherlock Holmes' uh, case books uh, describe uh, our um, approach to science like little else. So I decided to actually bring my book with me today and give you a little quote um, to describe that. So in one of his cases, um, you know, he has, he's talking with uh, Watson, a sidekick, and uh, describes the theory on how uh, to solve the, the mystery, the murder mystery. And uh, Watson says, oh, this seems uh, most improbable. And Sherlock answers, well, we must fall back upon the old axiom that when all other contingencies fail, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And in some sense, for us, understanding uh, open questions and fundamental physics are not that different from that, right? So we need to understand um, the signatures, observational signatures of uh, theories in general relativity, in multi-messenger astronomy, or in extensions of general relativity to actually uh, infer what is the right description of nature. So in some sense, we are playing gravity detectives using black holes and gravitational waves. And if I had to summarize uh, the main questions uh, beyond just astro, well, I shouldn't say just, but beyond astrophysics, I would uh, come up with three uh, main categories that I've listed here. So one is related to cosmology, dark energy, and the late-time acceleration of our universe. One is a question of uh, dark matter. So we know from observations that more than 80% of all gravitating matter is uh, made up of something that's non-baryonic. So it's not the matter that is the stuff that we know about, right? So in, because we don't know what this uh, more than 80% of gravitating matter is made of, we call it dark matter. But that's, I would say, one of the really uh, long-standing um, mysteries and puzzles in fundamental physics and connects uh, gravity and particle physics. I'm not going to talk about this today, but I just want to advertise that we are actually also finishing up a project with uh, my PhD student, Giuseppe Ficara, where we are looking at binary, black hole binaries sourcing um, a, a massive scalar field uh, that is a good candidate, a good model for some of these dark matter candidates. What I want to focus on today is the last box here, this red box, where we are still searching for a theory that consistently combines gravity and quantum physics. Both of these theories have changed, revolutionized physics in the 20th century, and yet we are still struggling putting them together in a consistent way. I'm not going to uh, propose any new theories of quantum gravity, but what I'm interested in is to uh, take features that are common to a large class of candidates for quantum gravity and to ask the question, you know, if those are true, or if these features are there, how would they actually be reflected in, for example, gravitational waves? So how would we be able to um, measure them? And I'm sh just showing one of those slides that we've already seen uh, multiple times today and in the last few days, because I uh, think this is really impressive, right? So this is a, a list of black holes and neutron stars uh, that have been detected by LIGO Virgo, or I should say now, uh, since last year, it's also the LIGO Virgo Kaka collaboration. And uh, 
But only a little more than six years ago, we started with the first observation of gravitational waves coming from two uh, inspiraling and merging uh, black holes. And now, it's really only six years later that we have about 50 new black hole, black hole uh, mergers and the gravitational, wave detections, uh, the gravitational waves detected um, that were emitted in these, in these mergers. Down here in uh, orange, we also have the neutron stars detected by, uh, in the form of gravitational waves. And uh, this plot is from the summer, so here we already have the neutron star black hole collisions um, that were reported earlier this year. That is to show that we are now really in the position or really entering this era of um, having data, having gravitational wave data, and we start actually being able to do science with it. Doing us, we have heard a lot about astrophysics in this workshop, but I also want to highlight that uh, we can uh, use this to also probe uh, for questions in fundamental physics, like the ones that I showed you on the previous slide. Yeah, so we are really uh, now starting being in the era of precision gravitational wave data. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to pretend that uh, people haven't tried to test strong field gravity with uh, uh, observations that are already there. They have, and this is just one example. Um, I know it's a very busy plot, but uh, the idea here is the following, that you say, if I have two compact binaries, they are inspiring. If, the, if gravity is still relatively weak, we can describe this motion with a post-Newtonian um, description. And then if you want to check for deviations from this uh, post-Newtonian description in general relativity, what you can do in a theory agnostic way is just adding um, parameters at, at each coefficient in this post-Newtonian expansion. And here what you're seeing is a um, constraint on um, this kind of uh, extra parameter at, e at each order in the post-Newtonian expansion obtained by varying one of those parameters at a time. You can also do uh, consistency tests, uh, uh, that is, do I get the same um, parameters that I would expect from my in-spiral merger and ring down? But all of these come with some caveats as well, and I just would like, it to, uh, would like to remind you of what these are. So a lot of these tests, at least at the moment, um, basically test against the null hypothesis uh, GR. GR is correct. And part of the problem is that we don't really have complete in-spiral merger ring-down models if you want to extend general relativity. The other one I already mentioned, you know, varying one of these uh, parameterized post-Newtonian, that's uh, what it's called, parameters at a time, may not be completely consistent, right? So you may ask, well, if, if I have the specific theory of gravity, you will change more than one parameter at a time. How do, do you reconcile this with the constraints that we uh, have here? And the next question is, if you have the theory uh, agnostic constraints, how do you actually match it to specific theories? And in order to do that, we actually need, at least uh, you know, for a few examples, uh, theory-specific modeling that include uh, the inspiral and the merger as well which means we need to go to numerical relativity beyond just Einstein's uh, gravity. And that's part of what I'm working on. I decided to uh, bring you one example today. Um, oh, yeah, so yes, uh, so the question is, do we have series? Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so we do have a lot of series, a lot of ideas of what this, you know, non-GR effects could be. There are plenty of them. Um, but the question is, do we have actually uh, concrete observable predictions? We are slowly getting there, so there has been a lot of progress over the last couple of years, um, but we are still not at the uh, level where we have production simulations in extensions of general relativity. And now comes my disclaimer, so I'm actually go going to show you one example, um, which is looking at black hole binaries in series that involve a quadratic curvature term. So they um, loosely go as scalar gauss bonnet gravity. Think of them as curvature squared. I will show you the action on the next slide. But uh, my reason why I'm interested in uh, this theory, because I had to pick one, right? The, con the computer is not really good at uh, having a parameterized um, implementation. So I decided to um, look at a class of theories that allows us to study higher curvature corrections that may be relevant in the strong field regime of gravity. You can also make arguments that at least some types, some subtypes of the scalar Gaussian gravity uh, is inspired by the low energy limit of uh, string theory. But I'm looking at actually at a, a much broader class than that. So for me, this is really, you know, 
a, a model that's representative for a wide theory class that involves uh, quadratic curvature terms. Now, what is this action? So the action that we have here uh, involves the uh, Einstein-Hilbert term. In the beginning, we have a coupling to a scalar field. Here's the kinetic term of the scalar field. And then highlighted here in red, I have the coupling between the scalar field via a general coupling function and the Gauss-Bonnet invariant. The Gauss-Bonnet invariant is this particular combination of the Riemann tensor, the Ricci tensor, and the Ricci scalar. And the, the choice of this coupling function actually selects uh, specific subclasses with quite different features for the black hole solutions that uh, then also uh, impacts the dynamics in a binary. And that's what we are going to look at in a moment. So the first type, or what I would like to call type one, is um, uh, characterized by having the derivative of this coupling function with respect to the scalar field always being non-zero. So for example, uh, if you choose this coupling function to be just phi, uh, people in the community would call that shift symmetric scalar goes one of gravity. Or if you have this kind of dilaton coupling, which is essentially the coupling that comes by uh, performing a dimensional reduction um, from a high dimensional theory of gravity. So that's the one that would come about if you are inspired by string theory. And these two, uh, so this uh, type uh, always leads to black holes with scalar hair. And we will see on the next slide why, why that is. Um, so in this case, the scalar field will always be sourced by the space-time curvature. The second type uh, is characterized by the, uh, again, by the uh, coupling function. And in this case, the derivative of the coupling function with respect to the scalar field actually can vanish. Examples for this uh, are this kind of quadratic coupling here or e to the phi squared type couplings. And in this case, uh, the black hole solutions of general relativity, so the Schwarzschild solution and the Kerr solution, are still solutions to the theory. And you can have a spontaneous scalarization of these black holes um, if the curvature of the space time becomes large enough. And again, we will look at a few examples uh, as we go along. Um, I should probably stop here for a second if there are any questions. And let me also reiterate, if anyone wants to ask me anything in between, just you know, raise your hand and we can uh, have a quick stop. Yes. Sorry, I'm not really familiar with alternative theories, but mm. what's the metric you're going to use here? So how do you calculate the Riemann tensor? So this is at the moment still a general metric. So it's a, just a general Lorentzian metric. And I will look at, uh, so in this uh, talk, I will look mostly as, uh, at time evolving space time, so at black hole binaries evolving. I should also, thanks for the question actually, should also as a disclaimer say that everything I will present here today is in the decoupling limit, meaning that I look at the evolution of the scalar field as sourced by a background space time. But I'm not, uh, feeding information about the scalar field back on, onto the space-time. Well, not everything, most of them. I will uh, tell you when I'm not doing that. Mary, you also had a question? No, I have a comment. Uh, I wouldn't call these models quantum gravity. I would call them modified gravity. Yes. Well, I'm, so I don't like to call them modified gravity because then there are people who will say, oh, you, you know, if I take a, a scalar and a vector, that is the modified gravity. Yeah, but, but they are not so, quantum gravity. They no, they are not. From, from Mary, you're absolutely right. So this is not quantum gravity. It's, you know, it's inspired by some, some models, so I would say this is one uh, class of beyond GR series um, that are inspired. It comes, as you said before, from extra-dimensional string theory, then we can call it. Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 no, uh, that's, that's a good comment. So, yeah, so let's, so I usually would call them beyond GR series. It's one class of beyond GR series um, that are in part inspired by quantum gravity models. Yes, good. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, and you said on a previous slide that these could come from compactified Lovelock theories. Yes. I, I know what a Lovelock theory is. What, in what sense is it compactified? So if you take Lovelock theory in five dimensions, five space-time dimensions, where the gauss bonnet invariant is not just a topological invariant, and you can compactify down from five dimensions to four dimensions uh, by uh, uh, symmetry, then you will get this extra scalar field and you will get this e to the phi type coupling from that dimensional reduction. Yep. Okay. Tell me just a stupid mm -hmm. question. The last term in the action, it, it, the structure of it, it's not, it, it, it doesn't have the invariance necessary, right? The... What do you mean? So this is just the kinetic term, the last term. 
Oh, but what do you mean by del? Is it? Oh, so this is just the gradient of the scalar field. So it's the standard uh, kinetic term of the scalar field gradient gradient. So you don't mean just the spatial gradient? No, so this is a, if you take the space-time metric, yeah, yeah. this okay. term, I just chose to write yeah. it in a short form. Yeah, okay, I'm fine then. Yep, good. Okay, any other questions? Well, I have a question. Okay, Marco. <laughs> you might answer to this question later on. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, black holes in this theory, are they stable or not? And I'm telling you, many years ago when I was young and... Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. uh, for example, if, if, you, if you forget the gauss bonnet term mm -hmm. and the scalar field, you find a series of solutions. And uh, the static non-rotating n-dimensional black holes. You, okay, so can you repeat that? So you want to so, forget about this for, term? No, for example, simple term. Mm -hmm. right? if, you, if you remove the gauss bonnet. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and you solve in the n dimensions the static, uh, mm -hmm. static solutions. You find uh, a series of solutions depending on constant of integrations. Uh, the n dimensional spar shield is 1, mm -hmm. and uh, being 1, you perturb it and it becomes a naked singularity, right? Okay, okay. So, so I was wondering if they are stable or not, and if, if they are, if this is the Gauss bonnet that makes them. Right, right, right. So this is a very good question. So the black, so the solutions are, are actually black hole solutions seem to be stable, and people have studied the mode stability of those solutions. Um, but you're also right that there is a limit on how massive the black holes can be, or we can translate that in a limit onto this coupling constant alpha gb. Um, and if that coupling constant exceeds a certain value, we would indeed have a naked singularity. So that has actually been shown in the paper introducing this theory uh, in 95 by Kantian collaborators. Um, so yeah, that's absolutely a fair point. And then maybe we take this one question and then I should continue so that I can actually show you some results. Hi, uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear you. You were calling for me. So I, I wasn't expecting um, to be my turn. First of all, I would like to make it very briefly so Elby can continue in her slides because I would like to, to hear what she has to say more. But I just ask it, wanted to ask a clarification because you didn't say much about alpha the coupling constant. Are you going to assume that this is actually plan scale or okay. or are you going to take it completely general? Yeah, so uh, the coupling constant uh, first of all has dimension of mass squared so I will use a dimensionless version of this alpha gb um, and at the moment I will work in the decoupling limit so assuming that this alpha is small. Yeah. With the so I will mention the one exception uh, in this talk, but in general I will assume the coupling to be small. So then I will continue and tell you about this first type of scalar gauss bonnet gravity series. So just to recap, in this case, the derivative of the coupling function with respect to the scalar field is not zero and is never zero, nowhere in the space-time. Um, and the, one of the examples that I will focus on is the shift symmetric case. So this coupling function f is just a constant times uh, the scalar field. And if we now look at the scalar field equation, we uh, get the following. So we have the wave operator acting on our scalar field. Well, in general, this would be related to, well, just the coefficient coupling function, uh, coupling constant, derivative of the coupling function times the gauss bonnet invariant. And in this particular case, shift symmetric case, the right-hand side here really is just a coefficient, a number times the gauss bonnet invariant. And people have actually shown that in this case, black holes always have scalar hair. So, I mean, there, is a, there are mathematical proofs about it, but uh, just for here, so you can actually think about it. If you have a non-zero uh, curvature, if you have a black hole, then um, this gauss bonnet invariant is nothing else but the Kretschmann scalar of our space-time, and that will always source our scalar field. So... Um, I've actually shown that uh, with a numerical evolution back in the day when I first started wor uh, working on this topic, we started with a space-time, well, just a single black hole space-time, zero scalar field, let it evolve, and we uh, showed that the scalar field indeed forms dynamically and approaches a, a solution that people have already found analytically before. Good. So now we take two of these. Yeah? So we have our hairy black holes here. Take two of these. And this is the next step in this. Uh, project that we had done again now it's uh, some two years ago where we said okay let's actually implement the equations uh, numerically 
And I'm using, so I actually developed this uh, numerical relativity library that I called Canuda, together with uh, Miguel Zeliao, Matt Alley, Giuseppe Ficara, who are, are my PhD students um, from London, and most recently, uh, Hector Ocada da Silva. Uh, the code Canuda is an open source library for um, beyond GR series or these coupling to light fields. In, uh, it's fully compatible with the Einstein toolkit. Some of the arrangements are actually part of the toolkit, some are not yet, and you can find all of these in our uh, Git repository. Good. So what we've done is implement the equation that I just showed you for the scalar field, and as I said, I'm working here in the decoupling limit, so I have in the background uh, two black holes. In this case, uh, the animation that I will show you, I will have two black holes with a mass ratio one to two. I will let them orbit around each other for about 10 uh, orbits, and then they will merge. And the scalar field is sourced by, these, uh, by the space-time dynamics. And you can think of it as having two scalar field charges orbiting around each other. Now, what do we expect if that's happening? Let's just look at our animation here, and I hope you can see this. Yeah, so we have our scalar field um, here, in some sense, or charge around, anchored around each of the black holes. This is the equatorial plane for our binary. The larger scalar bulge is actually the smaller black hole because it's sourced by the space-time curvature, which is smaller around, uh, which is larger uh, around a small black hole. And as these two um, scalar field charges orbit around each other, they start emitting scalar dipole radiation that carry away energy from our system. Um, and here we can nicely see um, this uh, scalar dipole uh, radiation being emitted. Until, we, um, until our black holes in the background are now merging. So this is a merger point. Uh, at this stage, our space-time is essentially becoming axisymmetric. Uh, All non-axisymmetric scalar field modes are dissipated away, and our final solution is a single rotating black hole with an axisymmetric scalar field uh, here around it. Let me just stop here because it's just starting again. And now the question you may ask, of course, is if I have such a configuration that I have these uh, orbiting scalar charges that produce scalar dipole radiation um, that dissipate energy away from the system, how may that impact my gravitational waves? So I haven't done the full implementation yet for the numerical part, for the, inspiral, for the merger part, but we have done work with um, Banaf Shira uh, Lilu in Amsterdam, um, Tanya Hindra and Samaya Nasanka and Nestor Ortiz, where we actually looked at the in-spiral, so the post-Newtonian description of the system. And uh, before our work, the only available work was um, to, very, to low post-Newtonian order, essentially just looking at the scalar field fluxes and how they would impact um, the binary. So that's uh, work done by Kent Yagi, Leo Stein, Nico Yunus, and uh, Takahiro Tanaka from about 10 years ago. Um, a few years ago, Felix Julia and Emmanuel Alberti looked at the problem again and looked at uh, the Lagrangian and sensitivities, but again, uh, not at the full waveform. So our work here with Banaf Shri was um, uh, really calculating the gravitational waveform up to a 1 pn order. Um, not so this is a one exception where I say we are not assuming a small coupling. And in principle, we are, uh, she actually derived the equations for general coupling functions. So here we are showing you an example for the hairy black holes. But in principle, we could also uh, adopt those for the second part of the talk. And um, let me just explain the plots here because they are quite busy. So I will start in the middle, actually, where I have the strain um, of uh, the gravitational waveform as a function of time. And the frequency evolution also as a function of time. Time equals zero here corresponds to the signal having uh, roughly 10 hertz. So when the signal would enter the LIGO band and then evolve through it, and our system here again is a black hole binary with a mass ratio of one to two. Uh, we specified a total mass to be 15 solar masses and also specified uh, our coupling constant, just to be specific here to give an example. And what you're seeing here is that at the beginning of the evolution, of course, uh, oh, one more thing, so um, the black curve here uh, is for general relativity. The blue curve is the one for uh, scalar Gauss monogravity. Yeah, and what we see here early on in the evolution, of course, um, the signals overlap because we've aligned them to enter the LIGO band at the same time. Late 
in, uh, in the evolution, uh, the waveforms start to uh, uh, disagree. So we see that they actually start to deface um, here, and that's because the scalar field is radiating energy from the system. So the uh, black holes are in spiraling faster. And then, of course, we know that the orbital uh, frequency is related directly to the gravitational wave frequency. So that's why we have this dephasing here, the faster in spiral, uh, higher frequency evolution. And then uh, close to the merger, we have a completely dephasing. So in black, we still have here our um, uh, GR signal and the um, Blue, the uh, signal in scalar gauss bonnet gravity, has much higher frequency and is already much higher in amplitude. Yes, and I think there's a question here. Do you hear me? Yes, Megan. Yes, I can. Hey, oh, hey do you, can you clarify whether you have equal mass black holes in this case and non spinning? So, in this case, um, we have actually a mass ratio of one to two, but still non spinning, non -spinning. but not spinning, yeah. So, uh, adding spin would mass be. Mass ratio one. Hmm? The no, right. the mass ratio is uh, one half. Yeah, or or if I transfer mass ratio two. In, in so it's binary. Hmm? Okay. okay. So sorry, there is there is a delay. I can't even. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'll, you, I'll type it. <laughs> yeah, but you can hear me fine, right? So the mass ratio is two, but no okay. spin. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep. Yeah, so that would actually yep. be interesting to see how this compares to, uh, once we add spin, but we are not quite there yet. Yeah, so this uh, was a first study, and we have a lot of follow-up projects actually uh, based on this one. Good. Okay, so this is what we have for the first type. So just to recap, in this case, first type, we always have hairy black holes. When they orbit around each other, they produce scalar dipole radiation that leads to a phase shift in the gravitational wave signal. Good. Let's actually move on to the second case, um, type 2. So in this type, uh, and again, I will take one example. We uh, take here the coupling function to be just phi squared, and forget about the zero here. Um, and if we insert that in our uh, scalar field equation, the general form is here. The eta is related to the alpha gb, so this is just a constant. Um, so now we can write our scalar field equation essentially as an effective klein gordon equation with an effective mass term that is radial de or space dependent. Yeah? And now, of course, we can study uh, the properties of this uh, klein gordon equation. And uh, first of all, we know uh, that if the derivative of the coupling function with respect to the scalar field is zero, which is this term here, then the solutions of general relativity, so the Schwarzschild and Kerr solution, still exist. And we also know that if the, this effective mass squared, which is related to the second derivative of the coupling function and the gauss bonner invariant, so if that effective mass squared is larger than zero, and people have actually shown that uh, the uh, Schwarzschild and Kerr solution are unique. Good. But now you can also imagine this term, this uh, uh, second derivative of the function times gauss bonner invariant, to have the opposite sign. That is, the uh, effective mass squared may actually be negative. And in this case, you uh, have a t can have a tachyonic instability, which leads to spontaneous uh, production of the scalar field. And this is what I'm showing you here uh, on the right-hand side. This is, a, this is a phase space of the black hole solutions. Actually, this example is a nonlinear solution. So second uh, exception to my I'm only in the small coupling limit. Yeah, so here we have um, the coupling constant in units of solar mass squared versus um, the mass of our solution in units of solar mass squared. In white are the regions where our GR, so Schwarzschild, uh, solution exists. And then we find these extra scalarized solution um, as highlighted here by this band structure. If we are in the decoupling limit, we can only capture the onset of this instability, so the lower part uh, here. So this is what, we are going, what I'm going to show in my numerical simulations. And only if you include nonlinear effects, so back reaction onto the space-time, you actually get this band structure here. Good. This is an example for non-rotating solutions. Uh, last year, uh, people, and uh, uh, first and foremost, I think Alexandro Dima and collaborators, have found that if you have rotating black holes, 
then the gauss bonin invariant can have uh, regions in the space-time where it's negative. And then if you choose your uh, coupling uh, also to be neg negative, you get uh, spin-induced scalarization. That's what they called it because this is a scalarization that does not appear for non-rotating black holes. You only have that if you have rotating black holes with sufficiently high spin. Um, and we will see uh, uh, actually what that does to our binaries uh, in the very last slide today. Oh, almost last slide today. Yeah, but here we were now interested in what's, uh, you know, again, uh, asking the question, if we have these black holes that can spontaneously scalarize, what would that do into, to a binary? And we actually, are, so uh, when we started this project, we were actually going back to the literature uh, looking at neutron stars in scalar tensor series. So Carla is actually an expert on that because you have done some of the work. I have taken the pictures from a different paper, but you have uh, done a lot of this work. And what, what's happening here is the following. So we've heard about Brand's Dicker theory in uh, Jeff's talk uh, earlier. And if uh, here you have a coupling function that goes like phi squared, then your scalar field equation becomes the wave operator acting on the scalar field. And on your right-hand side, you have some, again, B is just some constant, so uh, not important what this is. And then you have the scalar field times the trace of the energy momentum tensor of your uh, neutron star matter. And again, if... Um, this um, parameter is chosen correctly, then isolated neutron stars can also spontaneously scalarize. So the mechanism is also a tachyonic instability, similar to what I've shown you for the black holes. And this was realized uh, in the early 90s by Damour and esposito Farese for a single black hole. Uh, sorry, for a single neutron star. And now, uh, when people looked at binary seraph, and as I said, so Carlos has very excellent work uh, doing that, um, uh, they realized two things. So if I take two neutron stars that are not scalarized in the scalar tensor theory with a phi square coupling, and they inspiral, and the orbits become compact enough, then uh, again you can spontaneously scalarize, um, so you can spontaneously um, uh, excite a scalar field. So that's what they call dynamical scalarization. And then you can have a case where one of the neutron stars is uh, scalarized, the other one is not and you look at your uh, inspiring neutron stars, and you see that you can induce a scalarization in the companion, again, if the uh, binary becomes compact enough. Yeah, so what we expected starting out looking at binaries was actually something similar that we thought we would find dynamical scalarization in binaries, in these scalarized binaries in gauss bonnet gravity. Yes? Uh, I have a question mm -hmm. so about the binary case. Mm -hmm. Uh, is this is the scalarization like uh, induced by the well? I guess also by the fact that you get something more compact, but also like by the fact that you have orbital rotation. Um, not necessarily. So I think it's really the compactness of the orbit, and you see. Uh, so this is the equation that you're solving, right? So here you uh, source your scalar field by the energy momentum tensor by uh, by a neutron star matter. So um, I don't think it's related necessarily really to the rotation. And Carlos corrects me if I'm wrong. Yeah, okay, very good. So let's see what's happening in the black hole case then. And again, so to do the study, we, we extended my library Canuda. And to start with, we actually uh, looked at a very simple problem. We didn't even look at an orbiting binary, we just looked at a head on collision. So the simplest case of a black hole, black hole binary that you can think of. And uh, we looked at four different cases. Let me just walk you through those uh, step by step. Um, so the, uh, what I have here on the left are es essentially uh, diagrams of the uh, scattering process or the uh, collision processes that we are looking at. And here on the right, I'm showing you the scalar field monopole. So the, phi, so the zero, zero mode of our scalar field, rescaled by the extraction radius, so rescaled by the position uh, of where we are measuring the scalar field as a function of time. And t equals zero in this shifted coordinate system corresponds to the time of merger. Yeah, so this is what we are looking at here. So the first case, thinking about, oh, this dynamical scalarization of two non-scalarized neutron stars. So let's do the same experiment with, with our two black holes. They are both not scalarized, as indicated by this S bar, S bar here. So that's our, our, our in states. And then the final black hole was also not scalarized. So the corresponding line is a black one down here. So here, essentially, uh, the scalar field just dissipated um, uh, away. Good. 
uh, let's look at the other extreme case, which is the green line here, so case D. Here we started with two scalarized black holes. We cranked up our coupling constant very much, such that we knew our final black hole should certainly be scalarized. Um, and in this case, we saw the scalar field growing exponentially until the merger, and then it settled down to the scalarized solution that we would expect. But now let's look at cases where the coupling constant is not very large. It's set uh, in such a way that one or both of the initial black holes are scalarized. So this is here the red and the blue uh, case. And let me just show you the animation of what's happening. So here we will see, again, the equatorial plane, two black holes colliding head on. One of them will carry a scalar, uh, scalar here, the other one will not. And this is what we're seeing. So here is our not scalarized black hole, our scalarized black hole on the right. The white lines, if you can see them, indicate either curvature uh, lines of our gauss bonnet invariant. And let me just run this again so that you can see what's happening. So here are our two black, so this is again the scalar field uh, evolution. Um, this is our scalarized um, solution. They are now colliding, and the scalar field starts just dissipating. So the scalar, so what we, we call this, uh, our scalar field is uh, dynamically descalarizing. Yeah, and the reason why that's happening is the following. So let me just finish that one, and then I can explain what's going on here. So remember that I showed you that the scalar field is sourced by the Gauss-Bonnet invariant, that is by the space-time curvature. Well, if I look at the Gauss-Bonnet invariant, and I just, just for simplicity, let me take a single non-rotating black hole uh, and look at the, um, what it is on the horizon, then the Gauss-Bonnet invariant goes like one over the mass to the force times some constants. Yeah, but that's the behavior, which means that if I have a small black hole, the curvature is actually larger. And if I merge two small black holes into a larger one, my mass increases, that means my curvature decreases. And all of a sudden, uh, the curvature is no longer large enough to actually support our scalar field. And that's why our solutions are descalarizing. Yeah, so this is what's going on here physically. And if we uh, go back to our scalar field versus time plot, this is precisely what we are seeing. So the uh, line corresponding to our animation is this red one here. So we have a scalar here uh, before the merger. And after the merger, it's just decaying in time. It's just descalarizing. Good. So um, that was the first study thereof. And the uh, first time we found this nonlinear uh, effect of dynamical descalarization, I should add that there's a more recent paper by uh, Will East and uh, collaborators where they started looking at that in the um, including back reaction, but still a small coupling. So there's a lot to come. And this is actually uh, going to be really interesting here. So da David, how much time do I have left? You have 10 minutes, but you had a lot of questions, so you can go. Okay, okay. No, I'm almost done, but I do want to show ongoing work. So um, together with uh, Matt Alley, who is one of my PhD students, um, and then Hector and Nico, we actually extended this work and now are looking at inspiraling uh, black holes. And we also uh, looked at cases where one or both of those black holes were spinning. Remember, I mentioned as a side note that there's a spin-induced scalarization that uh, Alexandru uh, Dima has found and other groups are following him. Um, so that's what we were trying to see here because uh, you know, what we were thinking is that now if I have a uh, inspiraling black hole binary, we know that our final black hole will have spin and actually uh, will have a sufficiently large spin to possibly uh, scalarize. Okay, so I will show you two animations. As I said, this is all work in progress. I hope that we, so we are just starting to write this up. Um, the first case, we will have two scalarized black holes and these two black holes are spinning. So let's look at this case first, since I have the time to show both animations. So here we actually see both the equatorial plane and the um, Z X plane. So the one that's orthogonal to our orbit, orbit plane. These two black holes uh, here are spinning. And we uh, gave just a small scalar field perturbation uh, onto it, which is now uh, increasing due to the uh, um, spin-induced scalarization. 
um, it in the inspire produced uh, scalar uh, radiation and after the merger just uh, dissipated the scalar field again. So this is again an example for dynamical descalarization and this is just to show this is also happening in an inspire. So that was not just unique to a head-on collision. This indeed uh, is also found in an inspire. Um, but now I want to show you uh, the last case, and actually this one is not quite correct. So here we start with two non-scalarized black holes um, that are inspiring and mer uh, merging into a final rotating black hole, and this should actually be a scalarized uh, case here. So let me just show this. So this was just some um, initial uh, transient, and now we have these two black holes uh, orbiting around each other. Again, the color coding is... Um, the absolute value of the scalar field amplitude as sourced by the black holes, and we see nothing really seems to happen. So we have this in spiral, the black holes are happily orbiting around uh, each other, scalar field does not do anything because it uh, is not excited here. The black holes are now merging, forming a final rotating black hole, and then only after a while we now now start seeing the scalar field getting excited due to the spin-induced scalarization. Well, after the merger. So here I have the following question for you, right? So if we, sorry, let me just stop here. Um, so if we uh, think about doing tests of general relativity, this is actually a case where the scalar field, so the modification to general relativity, remains hidden until well after the merger. It's not excited, yeah? So, um, and I think it's a really interesting case because nothing happens in the inspire, no scalar field. Not, the merger itself will also look just like uh, GR, and only well after the merger, because we have this rotating black hole, we have start getting uh, scalar field excited. Okay, so let me actually uh, um, kind of summarize and think a little bit about the imp observational implications that this work has. So uh, this was a lot of, uh, you know, phenomenology, what uh, would actually happen if we are in a binary. So let me take this opportunity to summarize. Let's first look at the uh, type one. Remember the first type that we looked at, we had black holes that are always uh, carrying a scalar charge. So here the only channel that we have is to have a scalar or hairy plus hairy black hole going into a hairy black hole. And we've already seen that in this case, uh, during the in-spiral and the pre-merger, we have scalar dipole radiation. That is our uh, gravitational wave always defaces. Um, and the merger and post-merger uh, leads to a hairy black hole. So here the ring down uh, can also be modified. And people have actually looked at this model uh, in quite some detail and um, have done parameter estimation with the LIGO data to find uh, observational bounds uh, of this order. So the last one, the most stringent bound, comes uh, from a paper by Scott Perkins and collaborators, who is one of our uh, finishing PhD students at the University of Illinois. Um, so this, I think, is a quite set of cases. There are quite strong constraints on this part. But the second class of series where we can have the spontaneous scalarization just like to remind you that these are still completely unconstrained. Right, so here are my thoughts about this. The first set of uh, configurations that we may have, so uh, here I'm thinking about something like scalarized plus scalarized black holes, even if they go to a non-scalarized solution, or something where we ha only have one of the black holes scalarized. Uh, in the, uh, before the merger and the in spiral, they will still lead to scalar dipole radiation and to a dephasing of the gravitational wave signal. So here I would fully expect that a lot of the constraints that we already have should also apply or should at least be able to, uh, translatable. So this is some, something that we could, should be able to control. But then the last case that I have shown you where we had two non-scalarized black holes uh, becoming scalarized only well after the merger um, indicates maybe there are some hidden beyond GR effects that we can actually not even probe with gravitational waves. And this is something that I would like to leave for thought. And with that, I will actually come to my uh, summary and uh, outlook. So I hope I could uh, convince you that it's interesting to uh, look at extensions of general relativity, and in particular if we have uh, these higher curvature terms that may lead to new black hole solutions that carry a scalar hair or are scalarized. And just as a side note, we have actually something very similar for um, 
the cousin of scalar gauss bonnet gravity, where we are couple instead to the gauss bonnet invariant to the pontry argon density, which is parity violating, but also a higher curvature term. So uh, here as well, we would have hairy uh, black holes um, in the theory. I've shown you that if you have uh, scalarized black holes before the merger, they would typically lead to scalar uh, radiation and uh, uh, in the end uh, lead to a gravitational wave phase shift that we could try to use to constrain these type of series. Um, and then in the, uh, the final object, the post-merger, in the first type, we always have a hairy black hole, whereas in the second type, we found this new nonlinear effect of dynamical descalarization uh, de or spin-induced uh, scalarization. Yeah. And then uh, moving forward, so this is actually a, a work that's uh, ongoing. So the first question is, of course, if you extend this kind of study to uh, include back reaction effects, if you go to the nonlinear evolution, how uh, does it impact dynamical scalarization, the merger and the end state? So we have an ongoing co collaboration to do this. I know uh, Will East and Justin Ripley are also looking uh, at that uh, as well, using a different um, formulation. I've also started with, so Alexander is going to be my new postdoc. He's arriving in about two weeks. And he and Chloe Richards, who just joined my group as a PhD student, we're actually looking uh, at these dynamical Schoen Simon series to understand uh, what the, you know, uh, how the uh, effects are uh, in this kind of theory. And of course, the uh, end question is then, you know, what kind of observational constraints can we derive after uh, building? Uh, the late Inspire and merger, and hopefully uh, working with Banav, Shaitanya, and Samaya, also the Inspire merger ring down that waveform. So this is all about this. And before you thank me, if I may take half more minute, because I know there are a lot of numerical relativists here in the audience, uh, online or in person, I wanted to advertise a couple of things, just in case you're not aware of this yet. Um, so we started this summer to have uh, community calls for the numerical relativity community across the globe, across different code infrastructures. And uh, we have these calls. So they started in the summer. And Niels Fischer, who is a PhD student at the Albert Einstein Institute in Potsdam, uh, initiated them. And we uh, started having calls every first Monday of the month, uh, 9 AM local time here, uh, 11 AM for uh, central US, 6 PM uh, Central uh, Europe, and if you're interested, here's a wiki, and you, here you will also find the links to sign up. And then we are, I'm, well, I'm uh, co-organizing or organizing two workshops next year. One is in Benasca in Spain, beautiful place, science center uh, for new frontiers and strong gravity. So you're all um, very much welcome to join us there for two weeks. And then um, we are actually also organizing a workshop at uh, ISERM at, Bra at Brown University uh, for the NR community. Um, and that's probably going to be mid-August. And here the idea is to really bring, you know, new uh, people, new students or uh, postdocs in to actually uh, build a, a, an R community uh, with everyone together and to help you learn, get familiar, probably having a ha hackathon. So that we're still working on the ideas. But again, you're very welcome to join us. So and now I'm stopping. So thank you. <laughs>